Thanks very much. Thanks, Leslie, for that introduction. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Let's see if we can get an image up here. Uh oh. <laughs> there we go. Uh, before I uh, get into the substance of the uh, lecture tonight, I wanted to just briefly uh, show some slides introducing our, the work of our office. And I think the content of what I'll be talking about will make clear uh, what research means in the context of our practice. Um, so I oftentimes introduce that in more detail at the beginning of the lecture, but I think that'll become clear through the case studies that I'll be showing of projects that we've done, one of which is the project that we did for um, the harbor of New York and Jersey and for lower Manhattan, which uh, is frighteningly um, uh, prescient in terms of uh, our expectation was the conditions there would be as we uh, had shown them maybe 50 to 100 years from now, not, uh, not right away. But uh, maybe a more um, happy image. Um, we started our practice in 1993 in New York, as Leslie said. Um, and like many architects in the city, uh, you begin by doing um, interiors. And, and one of the things about New York is that you learn how to um, work within existing conditions and leverage qualities of space, of course, um, but also of light and, in some cases, sometimes of view. Uh, this is a loft that we did in Soho in, in New York City, one of our earlier projects. We were fortunate to be able to do um, uh, some freestanding buildings uh, uh, at relatively early into our uh, firm's um, life. This is a home that we did in Telluride, Colorado, outside of Telluride. But one of our um, segues into doing work in the public domain was to do exhibition design, temporary exhibitions. We did a number of exhibitions for the Cooper Hewitt Museum, uh, one on Henry Dreyfus, industrial designer, uh, one on skin in design, surface, uh, um, one on hotels, uh, exhibitions for the American Museum of Moving Image, and others. And then that led to the design of vitrines for the permanent collection gallery at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, a system of flexible vitrines that were created for this space. Uh, we then had our first uh, project for higher education institution. It was about uh, eight or so years ago uh, at Colorado College. We added to and renovated uh, the music and art department building there, uh, a building from the 1970s uh, designed by Edward Larrabee Barnes, one of the better buildings on campus. Uh, we've actually intersected with Edward Larry Barnes multiple times in our career. It's kind of interesting. We also find ourselves frequently engaging buildings from, as I think you will be doing in your practices or your experience, uh, buildings from the 1960s and 70s, which are in many cases very robustly built, but um, no longer serve the functions that are, that are needed of them or don't need code and whatnot. Uh, we've done uh, lots of projects in the public domain in New York City. This is a comfort station, which is a nice way of saying public restrooms, uh, at Union Square Park in um, uh, lower Manhattan. And we've done a number of projects where we've collaborated with Michael Van Valkenburg, who's a landscape architect based out of New York City. We've had a number of collaborations with other landscape architects as well. Uh, entered and, and won various competitions. This is one that we won that was not built, but a, a performing arts center in Weston, Connecticut. Uh, another one that unfortunately wasn't built was Motown Center in Detroit, which was a museum and cultural center in Detroit. But you know we learned from these, and they're a form of investigation, of course, um, in addition to the projects that, that are actually built. One of the things that's connected our work, aside from the methodology of how we study projects, which is to gather information, to analyze that, to use that to begin to frame strategic approaches to the project, one of the other things that's been consistent is a real interest in um, material and detail. Uh, we think that ideas in architecture are understood directly through how you use and experience a building or a space. And so we've always been interested, regardless of the budget, in um, the kind of material reality of a building or, or, a, or an element. This is one of our first projects, which is a fence on the corner of Thompson and Broom Streets in lower Manhattan that was made out of steel plate and then W section steel posts where a reveal is created between each of them uh, that defines kind of rhythm on this corner site. Um, we've explored using conventional materials in sometimes unconventional ways. This is a um, cedar siding on the house we did in Martha's Vineyard. We're trying to work within vernacular uh, materials and also known ways of building in, um, on this island. 
but to create something that would have a scale in this case related to the landscape and also in a way uh, similar to the site, uh, the way in which it casts shadows on itself, the wall casts shadows on itself in a way similar to the trees surrounding this, this kind of beautiful scrub oak woods surrounding the site. Uh, we've done a lot of investigations of how digital fabrication technology can transform material qualities. This is a, a study that we did called Coro Lamp, which was taking corrugated cardboard and bias cutting it and then looking at how it filters light uh, and also changes your uh, perception or view of the actual lighting element, light uh, fix, uh, lamp inside. This was finished about uh, seven or eight years ago. We did a whole investigation prior to this using a laser cutter in our office called Paper Wall Investigations of Transforming Paper. This led to one of the residential projects we did later on, uh, which was uh, CNC machined MDF uh, panels. Uh, that are t heavily textured and formed a series of screens that allow for the uh, selective uh, filtering of view and light and, and closing and opening spaces to each other within an apartment um, on Central Park West in Manhattan. As Leslie mentioned, this is one of uh, several projects that are underway right now. This is the restoration of Donald Judd's studio and home on Springs and Mercer Streets in Soho. The project is actually, this was taken before construction, the project is actually nearing the end of construction now and the scaffolding is down uh, over most of the building. And uh, it will be reopening uh, middle of uh, 2013 as a um, accessible uh, museum uh, run by the Judd Foundation, which will show Donald Judd's installed spaces in, uh, as he intended them to be seen. Um, and one of the things about this project, although it's very technical and very much about administration, is you know, the same care and consideration we take in our work, we thought about with respect to how to preserve the qualities that Judd felt were most important to his, um, his art, really, and the kind of integration of his art with building fabric. It's an amazing building, too, it's a beautiful building. Um, another project that we're doing, which is finished construction drawings and is going to go out to bid shortly, is an off-off Broadway theater company called the Flea Theater in Lower Manhattan. This is an image of a corrugated uh, custom core 10 steel uh, part of the facade. And then we're using a really beautiful brick from Denmark, Peterson brick, uh, for portions of this as well. This has three small theaters in it. And really interesting project kind of calibrate how this kind of gr grassroots and kind of gritty organization could maintain some of these qualities while being in a new facility. This is a detail from one of the elements in the Knoll project. This is a uh, stair that's supported by cables, but then wrapped with leather. One of the brands that Knoll owns is a leather company. And so this will connect. We're doing three floors of a, lower floors of a uh, tower in um, Midtown Manhattan. And then we're doing a retail state space for Knoll uh, in the same building. This will be going into construction shortly and open uh, probably uh, uh, May of next year. Uh, one of a couple of projects we're doing at the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, um, which is a neat place. I got married there, actually, so it's nice to <laughs> go back. Um, and uh, this is a ticket building and another comfort station so we're doing adjacent to a McKinney and White designed arch on the east end of the garden. And then we're doing a cafe. This one, actually, we're also using the same Peterson brick. Um, another unusual project uh, in New York City. Um, the DOT commissioner, the Department of Transportation, is a really dynamic uh, force in the city and in turning streets back into spaces that the public can actually um, use in a less than scampering for safety to, from curb to curb. So one of the initiatives she's undertaken is closing certain streets and making them into pedestrian spaces. And part of that was um, public art. So we, we designed a prototype a public art display panel and uh, that was it installed for testing in one of the spaces. It's, going, it's out to bid right now, and we're going to make a series of them to put in these spaces and put two-dimensional rep, um, uh, reproductions of art on them. And then some of the research we've done is doesn't it involve creating form at all and, and relates in a way to what I'll be talking about. Uh, we completed recently a study on how to expand design quality in projects funded by or built by the federal government in the United States. Uh, working for the GSA and the NEA as our clients. And they're in the process of turning that into a book that will be used for managers and leaders in, those, in other agencies of the federal government. So a kind of primer 
um, one of the things involved, that's a, a diagram of how we mapped out different initiatives that are happening in different um, agencies within the executive branch of the federal government in the U.S. And then this is a cross-section through a dormitory that we're doing at Tulane University now, another project uh, Leslie mentioned, which uh, is in construction documents that will start construction in um, uh, February, late February. It's a 256-bed dorm, and it's part of their residential college initiative. They're creating, uh, they have created, this is the first purpose-built dorm that will have a faculty and residence and house director as part of it, but also larger social spaces as well as study spaces. So to create a kind of new model within their campus uh, of studying and uh, social when we received the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award uh, last year, just thinking about uh, our practice and kind of reflecting on almost 20 years that we've been in practice and thinking about, well, what, have we, what do we think objectively we've contributed? Because we haven't, you know, we don't have a massive body of completed projects, but what do we think we have to add to um, the profession? And um, probably also relates to turning 50, which I turned 50 a few months ago, <laughs> maybe. But anyway, just um, uh, so, but one of the things that I've thought about for quite a while, and it, it relates to when I was educated in architecture at a time when there was a, um, the, the discussions were about maintaining the autonomy of architecture as a discipline, uh, that one that could preserve a kind of uh, formal uh, clarity and ability to communicate, but in so doing, in a way, constraining architecture uh, and limiting it, I think, um, from its potential to engage more broadly in social conditions and in relationships outside of uh, itself and outside of those having to do with form. And so um, I thought about uh, thinking about how maybe it's necessary to begin to think that the formal or um, uh, aesthetic dimension of architecture might recede in order to allow for a more powerful connection to social uh, relationships and a more powerful cultural consequence for architecture. I think that'll be more clear through the talk. But uh, what I want to do is map out uh, about half a dozen case studies of projects we've done that range in scale and also in physicality in a way from most physical and kind of uh, concrete to the most ephemeral with lots of overlaps between them. Um, but to talk about this condition of how architecture for us um, can be framed out in terms of circumstances and conditions outside of itself. And when done in a rigorous way can, I think, have quality and, and also have power that allows it to engage change, allows it to be a more dynamic participant in, in life. Uh, one of the, and so I'm going to be, the, the qualities that I'm talking about are really, in a way, framing architecture in, in terms of first both material and phenomena associated with material and thinking about design being generated out of that. Uh, performance, in the, specifically with respect to energy and a house that we did, a, that's a passive house certified project recently completed. 
uh, in terms of program, how program relationships and organization can begin to drive the way in which uh, design is framed. In terms of infrastructure, thinking about the design of infrastructure, that's the Rising Currents project, and how that uh, affects and impacts and creates a very powerful um, new sense of public space in the city. Uh, thinking about the process of design itself with respect to a planning project that we did for Lower Manhattan, uh, for um, the Alliance for Downtown New York, which is the largest business improvement district in New York City. And then finally, in a way, returning back to maybe the most Miesian of the projects, but thinking about how an experience, in this case particular to a site, can, can be thought about as the generative uh, impulse behind the design. So one of our early projects that we completed and really uh, has to do with the material quality of light and how light, or of glass, I mean, and how glass changes with respect to ambient light conditions is this small building in um, uh, Times Square. So very chaotic site. Um, uh, and the project is a recruiting station for Times Square. It's kind of humorous because the next project I'll be showing, we were also doing for Shiseido, a very large Japanese cosmetics company, the same time we were doing this recruiting station. And so uh, it's amazing the kind of the variety and, and overlaps that happen between projects. But the, the project, uh, you know, it's an incredibly small building. It's about 500 square feet. Uh, and it, it has basically a very simple program. It's got four desks, one for each branch of the military in the United States. And uh, interestingly, by the way, I was told that a lot of people who aren't from the United States come to this station and try to join our military. <laughs> um, but I don't think we had anything to do with that, but it's a very strange phenomenon. Maybe Times Square gets them all you know, confused. But uh, from very early on, we were um, aware that uh, because of the ambient light conditions in Times Square, the quality of glass that encloses the building would, uh, again, during the night and at certain times during the day, have a reflectivity in which the building could literally participate through this quality of alternating transparency and reflectivity with its site. And by locating a series of gel-covered fluorescent lights behind this glass layer, which I'll show in a second, um, under different conditions, you read the building as both a symbol uh, distinct from its site, but also one that's literally floating and, and a part of uh, this kind of commercial place. Uh, the, the facade, the two facades of the building that are the long facades along Broadway and 7th Avenue were created using a very simple technology at the time because of the budget limitations we had in the project, but um, using gel-covered fluorescent lights in this pattern. We looked at many different patterns, uh, one of which looked like the French flag, so we realized we were on the wrong track there before we ended up with this abstraction. Um, and then did a custom curtain wall that these lights are contained within and literally occupy a, a layer about six or eight inches outboard of the structure of the building. It's also an unusual site in that the whole building is designed to move because it's on top of a ventilation shaft for the solar system below. So if necessary, although it's an inactive shaft, if, they, if, if needed, the building is a rigid frame that can be moved from that location. Um, but Depending upon, as I said, the ambient light conditions and your orientation with respect to the building, um, your perception of the building changes. And the perception of the sort of symbolic presence of this flag rendered in lights changes as well. And again, sometimes depending upon oblique uh, versus frontal, uh, the building begins to become a part of its context in a way which I think leads to many meanings about what this symbol is, you know, obviously in the consequence of, in the, of its context. A uh, project we did at the same time was concerned with kind of even more reductive thinking about material, but how we could convey qualities of this product. This is a line of skincare products that was created by uh, Shiseido. And the essence of the brand, if you will, that they were trying to communicate was this feeling of calm and relaxation. Of course, the site that we were working with them was Madison Avenue and 54th Street in Midtown Manhattan. Um, but we immediately began to think about, and we work very iteratively through how we study um, our work on many levels. But one of the things that we test is uh, form through models and, and perspectives and other drawings. Uh, and so we began to work using a light box, and this project is about 12 years old, 
Uh, it's no longer extant. It was it was taken down about five or six years ago, but um, begin with to work with light itself as a material, and uh, the challenge was how to then eliminate any other extraneous elements and simply convey this quality, a, a sort of luminous quality, um, to the space. We did uh, and so what what we arrived at was a solution in which there are no uh, conventional light fixtures. The entire space glows and is uh, the lights uh, are two different color temperature fluorescent lights that are on, a, are on a computerized dimming system so that you got kind of very subtle fluctuations in light. Um, and then they were covered by um, fabric, uh, different degrees of translucency to filter that light. Uh, this required creating a mock-up to be able to understand that quality. This was in the space before it was uh, built. And then the final space, um, using fabric, organza fabric, in two or three different um, colors that was dyed for the project. Uh, but that's simply supported by gravity. Um, and the panels are actually, the widths of these panels are set by the way the fabric came from the mill. And then they're just weighted on the bottom. And so again, the idea was to create this kind of very calm environment um, and think about this light itself as a material and then went at night, when the space is not occupied, uh, the um, I don't know if I have a no, I don't have a night view, but uh, the actual space itself becomes a kind of representation of the qualities of this product. Uh, I don't have a slide of it in this more condensed form, but the other thing we did was create these vitrines. Actually, I think these were made in um, Ontario, Canada. All of the millwork for this at the time. Uh, but where they're, they're actually backlit uh, through fiber optics, the actual bottles, which are translucent as well. And really, the bottles become the kind of ornament and detail within the space. And then these qualities of overlapping and glowing light predominate. A now for something completely different uh, in terms of the, the nature of the project, but thinking about how architectural form can be defined through performance, in this case, energy performance. Um, this is a project that we were one of three selected um, uh, firms who competed to design a prototype uh, affordable energy efficient house for a low income neighborhood in Syracuse, New York. Syracuse is um, about 100 and or so miles uh, west of Albany, um, between Albany and Buffalo, New York, and a kind of Rust Belt city. Um, and we elected our team, and we worked in collaboration with another firm called Della Valley Bernheimer, to create a passive house. There are, I'm sure that um, Canada is looking serious at this, this because of the heating climate um, in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, but it's very, uh, there are very few examples of passive houses completed in the United States. So we chose to do this because we wanted to do something that would be a kind of low-tech, generally low-tech solution and one that might also help to um, build uh, in this area a knowledge of the techniques required to achieve the kind of energy performance that we were seeking in this project. But what emerged out of the process was a building form and, and shape um, very much determined by the, the specific functional requirements of Passive House. Um, and the, for those of you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Passive House, whether it's something much more familiar with here than in the States, but basically uh, created in Germany by a uh, physicist who studied actually in the United States in the 1970s and then went back and perfected this. Um, but he sort of was in the States at the time of the early uh, post-oil recession interest, the uh, first sort of wave of interest in uh, solar energy and passive uh, solar. Uh, but basically, the, the strategies hinge on three things. One is um, recycling heat that's created inside the uh, interior using a heat recovery uh, device instead of a boiler, um, using the heat of the sun as well as the heat from occupants to uh, warm the interior, and then a super insulated and very tightly sealed interior to hold the heat inside. Uh, I like this slide just because I think it's always good to have a slide of a really attractive sheep in your lecture. Um, but uh, it's always a moment where I can sit back and just enjoy the. Uh, but this, um, the, the, we like to think of our project as a sheep in wolf's clothing. I don't know quite what that means, but I like the way it sounds. But uh, the, the, one of the fundamental things, and you'll see it in the plans of the building, is that 
the, the walls are an R50 and the roof is an R60 insulation, so much, much more than normal uh, found in North America. And then the air tightness is considerably greater than um, um, conventional standards of building in America, which are pretty awful. Uh, but what that allows you to do is heat the house with the equivalent of a hair dryer. Um, that's what that icon's for. And this uh, shows the constructional um, system for the house. It's basically framed out of TGI joists. Uh, they minimize thermal bridging between the interior and the exterior. And you get this great cross section, which is like a kid's drawing of, of, a, of a building. It's as if you used a giant, thick magic marker to create the, the envelope of the building. But a tremendous amount of care and attention has to be taken with respect to all of the details to prevent thermal bridging and to not compromise the envelope, the performance of the envelope. We work closely with a firm called Transsolar based out of uh, uh, their home offices in Stuttgart, Germany, but then they have a New York City office as well. And I was surprised to learn, because I grew up in the Albany area, that Syracuse actually gets enough sunlight to make this type of project work with the appropriate amount of um, insulation. Um, and uh, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, every time I've been to Syracuse, the sun very seldom shines there. But, but our consultants proved to us that there was sufficient sun. But in order to uh, be sure that you'll have enough falling on the building, you actually have to do a, a mapping very precisely to determine how the specific site that you're building on, um, uh, how much sunlight it actually receives specifically, aside from uh, you know, what you generally know happens in that region. So this is a solar uh, 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 study that was done with a special kind of camera, fisheye camera. Uh, in order to minimize heat loss and maximize heat gain in the winter. Uh, the windows are oriented on the southern part of the house. Very few windows are on the north, or the, in this case, the east and the west are side yards, so there are buildings right next to them. And then the heat recovery happens through a, a device that you can't, oh, I should say, by the way, the windows that we use are Canadian uh, made. Um, triple glazed, argon filled, fiberglass frame uh, windows, which at the time, I think there's only one company in the United States you can actually get that, that, that makes, uh, make, uh, makes them now, but at the time didn't make them then. Um, the heat recovery device, as I said, is, is in lieu of a boiler, but basically recycles the heat. Uh, you have to mechanically ventilate this kind of building because it's so tightly sealed, you know, just to make, create a healthy environment inside, but with a very low level of air movement. So it's very draft free, uh, but it has an enthalpy wheel inside this heat recovery device, which basically takes heat out of exhaust air and gives it to fresh air that's brought into the building. But the result of doing all of this is that uh, the scheme as modeled um, uh, during the competition and then as, as built uh, achieves roughly a 70% reduction in energy use over a conventionally built house. So what that means, I think, is that um, alternate energy, such as solar hot water and photovoltaic, can actually begin to, to take care of a meaningful portion of what the demand that's remaining in the house. In the case, it, it also allows you to be um, very close to net zero. In the case of our project, we were on a grid already, and so we, didn't, we were connected to a gas line for hot water, which, um, but, uh, it's, it's a really great potential to uh, reduce energy dependence and also to reduce um, fossil fuel consumption. Uh, but the part related to maybe the way in which the design was most uh, overtly, in a way, um, uh, impacted by performance had to do with the way in which we tried to make the house feel as large as possible on the inside. It's 1,100 square feet. but make it as small as possible on the outside so it would have the smallest, it's almost how can something become as sphere-like as possible, have the greatest interior volume while also fitting on a site and corresponding to the zoning requirements for that site. Uh, this was at the time in our office, we were doing this project right when the bottom fell out of the recession in 2008 and we had a kind of gallows humor joke in the office that how many architects could be working on an 1,100 square foot house? Because I think between our office and our collaborators, we had about eight or 10 people for <laughs> three or four weeks on this. But the basic idea was to get a second story into this building 
to create a form that's actually, even though it's in an, a neighborhood that has very tightly um, adjacent lots, there are so many missing teeth, if you will, in the, in the neighborhood, as you could see from that aerial photograph, that the building would also be seen three-dimensionally as a kind of piece of sculpture, at least for the short term. Um, so basically, uh, this kind of tension between a kind of uh, iconic domestic form and then this sort of maximizing of the volume inside the building and then pulling in to create very easily recognizable porches, uh, front and back porch. The plans are a little hard to read, but basically a stair in the center. Um, the entry is on the top. In this case, the south is at the bottom. Uh, ground floor on the left has a kitchen, uh, dining, and uh, living space, and then a room in the front, which I'll show you in a minute, can serve a lot of different uses. One full bath on this floor, and then the second floor has an open space, two below, number one, that could become a future room, and then two bedrooms up there as well that are tucked under the eaves of the house. And as you can see also, the very thick walls, those are 16 inch thick uh, walls. Uh, the, the site work was thought about in terms of stormwater management. I'll talk more about this in a moment, but Syracuse, like many American cities, has a combined storm sewer system. So um, if you can manage stormwater on site, you can reduce the amount of effluent that flows into surrounding waters. So the uh, site is very gently bermed to contain some of the water within it, as well as to create a slight sense of privacy, and in a way it picks up on some of the fastening of the, of the form of the house as well. This is a view of the backyard. And then we were conscious of the kind of potential that the project could uh, be modified or could accommodate uh, easily different demographics within the neighborhood, so uh, not just a conventional sort of uh, parents and one or two children, but also a possible rental unit, um, a uh, extended family member like a grandparent living at, at home, a home office. Um, it's just cut off on the bottom, but those are, those are some, of, some of those are titled below those images. And this shows you kind of the character of the neighborhood, but with that was our site in the center and then, and then other sightings of the same building. And then using very simple materials, um, uh, we did use an exposed uh, lock deck uh, floor for the uh, second floor, which can be seen from below. It's a, so what you see is the actual structure spanning. It's cross laminated planks. Uh, and then concrete slab, which acts as a great uh, heat uh, absorber for the sun and slowly releases that as well. And just a few views of that project. It's actually occupied. It was purchased by a woman who works in the green energy field. Uh, and it took a little while because there's a, some sort of dispute going on between Passive House United States and Passive House Germany. But we, the, the project was certified about six weeks ago, uh, which is um, probably one of only maybe one or two dozen uh, houses in the United States that are certified by a uh, certified Passive House. So this is the street view. Uh, this is the side elevation. Uh, there's actually going to be a building only eight feet away from this side. The, the site next to us wasn't occupied. And that's why, one of the reasons why, aside from the solar and heat cooling uh, issue, is why it has one window. And then a view of the back. The yard, they, had, they did not implement the site work as part of this. They did add a basement during, during the project, which was not in the original competition drawing. The house is clad in uh, mill finish corrugated aluminum, uh, doesn't require any maintenance, uh, and then fiber cement panels for the soffits and, and fascias on the ends. And then the interior uh, view of the master bedroom windows, low windows on the right, and then the living space on the left. And then uh, another view up the stair very modest. This was built for 150,000 American dollars. Uh, still more expensive than many of the houses in the neighborhood, but again, was built by a housing advocacy organization with their own crews and as a means of showing that this um, way of building you know, could be um, beneficial and, and sort of testing this as one of several building techniques 
there were two other architects working as well, doing different, completely different strategies on other sites. Um, many of our clients uh, are designers in some way, or in the case of the Flea Theater, performers, but people in creative disciplines. Um, we've had a very odd, uh, maybe a series of projects that uh, we have a specialization now in designing architecture schools. So um, one of the first that we did, and they're very much program driven, that's why I want to talk about this, uh, a form of research that we've done that has segued from early material investigations has been uh, looking at program very critically and doing a whole series of program planning studies for across a wide spectrum of uh, program typologies. So everything from commercial and corporate office space to uh, different types of nonprofits. But then in the case of these few projects I'll be showing you, uh, architecture schools. So one of the first ones that we did was a renovation and addition to the architecture school at Princeton University. This was completed about five years ago. Uh, and in this case, actually, it wasn't really heavily program driven. It was actually driven by um, life safety and accessibility requirements. We created a new link between two wings of an existing building from the 1960s uh, that contained an elevator and a fire stair. The fire stair is sort of not evidently one, but is, is created through some um, uh, handling of creating a not very apparent um, fire enclosure around uh, this, this stair that wraps around the uh, elevator. But um, the only program element in this besides circulation is a student lounge. But the, this uh, new element, though, acts as a kind of hub that was missing within the existing building uh, to connect library and administration with uh, studios and classrooms, and also becomes uh, a very overt uh, and sort of symbolic and literal window between the program of the architecture school and the surrounding liberal arts buildings around it, uh, and something that had been quite missing in the, in the prior building that was connecting, a prior entry block that was connecting these two wings. But uh, before I talk about a competition entry that we did, just show you some of the kinds of ways that we diagram and understand program in a building. These are images from a program study that we're doing for the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, like many uh, architecture schools, they're adding research components to their programs. Uh, and then also uh, the library, which uh, in many places has book stacks, uh, is beginning to be thought of as valuable real estate, which can accommodate other programs uh, and also accommodate different ways of learning and accessing information. So the library, in a way, books are being moved out to storage, which you can always access through uh, requests. Uh, and then that space is being freed up. So this is one diagram of just uh, analysis of existing program relationships. Or um, sometimes programs are accommodating uh, growth um, this is a diagram from um, a planning study we did for Cornell Architecture School, College of Art, Architecture, and Planning. This was looking at just what is the capacity that studio, of studio space that's required in a building, in the buildings that they have. They have multiple buildings uh, adjacent to each other. This is um, looking at space utilization over time to determine you know, how many classrooms are needed or um, how, how efficiently is space being used. So this was going across different types of programs. This is another image from a program, a pro, the Harvard program study of these um, space utilization diagrams. And another diagram from the Cornell study, but looking at what happens when you um, reduce the um, number of stacks in the library and, and what, what does that do in terms of how, many, uh, how much space do you need. This was part of a larger argument we were we were creating. And then a slide from University of Michigan uh, program planning study. This is a, what we call a test fit where we were looking at once we'd actually defined a program, we looked at multiple iterations of how this program could be fit on the site. Um, and so this is three floors of the building. And then it's really not a design, although it has latent in it certain um, um, consequences going into design, but it's really just looking at uh, footprint and position, um, and then relative to existing programs in the building. The project I want to talk about is a competition that we did because it sort of shows the way in which a project was organized according to program very explicitly. It's a competition that we did to add to the Catholic University 
in Washington, D.C., architecture school. And um, they actually occupy an existing building in red on the campus that was an armory. It was a, or a gym, gymnasium, like an armory in a way, a kind of wide span structure and a, uh, open space inside. It was, uh, became the home of the architecture school in the early 80s. Uh, you can kind of see by the nature of that architecture. Um, and they wanted to expand. So uh, we began our study by looking at you know, programs within the building and uh, assessing, uh, taking the program as given, mapping out what that meant relative to their existing spaces. Uh, in this case, because it was a competition, we didn't have a lot of interaction with the client. So we you know, took the program as they stated and used that as the basis for the design. And what we were interested in doing was actually not this. Um, many times in, when you're making an addition to a building, you know, there's this temptation to think about the addition as a kind of completely separate element. Uh, and the center diagram is actually the kind of simplified diagram of the existing uh, program organization in their building. And then to the upper right is a diagram of the new program that they wanted. But our desire was to think about this as a very intrinsically connected kind of uh, set of relationships between existing and new so that the studio space and um, other elements could, could be closely integrated with the existing building organization. And so we located the studio blocks uh, in parallel with the existing studio, created a circulation zone between the two that becomes a kind of campus thoroughfare, a place for pinups and a uh, way of opening the school up to um, students from other departments, um, creating a kind of attractive public space within it. And um, this shows you the kind of final program diagram or uh, program diagrams with the plans, but looking at circulation, but also program organization in parallel one with the other. So we made a kind of sidecar, if you will, that attaches to uh, one side of this existing building and then contains these programs that really parallel and, and weave uh, crosswise back into the order of the existing building. Um, plans a little bit hard to read, but basically uh, colored plans are based off of these. Uh, and then the, there's a sort of circulation spine that you'll see in the perspective views in the center. Uh, looking at stormwater management, we worked again on this project with uh, TransSolar and also with Signe Nielsen, who's a very good landscape architect in New York with a firm called Matthews Nielsen. Uh, and here you can see the building. Also worked with a structural engineer named Guy Nordenson, who's based in New York as well. Created these series of these butterfly trusses that let daylight into these new studio space from the north uh, and then balance that with a little bit of light from the south diagram of this kind of parallel organization of new on the left and existing on the right. And then this gallery sort of spine between them that's bridged at a couple of points to connect back through uh, from one studio to the other. Diagram about um, the shading, self-shading that occurs through the, the way in which the roof is configured. <coughs> and then just take you through the project, uh, the, this was a very short, this was a one month design competition that was uh, cruelly done over Christmas um, last year. Uh, but, and, and it was one of these ones where the deadline is like July 10th, or January 10th, you know. It's kind of not nice when we do that, but. Um, so basically uh, a few images of that. This is the center circulation space on the bottom and then uh, kind of tiered um, uh, pin-up space and lecture space open to the campus uh, and visible in the prior slide at the, at the point of entry on the um, north side of the building. And then a couple of views from the studio spaces to that uh, space below. So kind of segueing from program as this kind of armature and, and this sort of um, uh, uh, criteria in which design is framed to thinking about infrastructure and the design of infrastructure as a way of rethinking public space. And this actually relates to um, what Leslie was talking about earlier and the events of the last few days in New York. Um, we uh, 
began thinking about sea level rise in New York actually in 2006. Uh, I'll show a project that we did initially um, in a moment. But one of the things that uh, the current mayor of New York commissioned in 2008, uh, and it was completed in 2009, was a climate risk report for New York. And one of the things it showed was that by the late, uh, by the 2080s, the incremental sea level rise would mean that the water level, the mean water level in New York would be approximately anywhere between 12 and 24 inches um, higher than it is now. And if the polar caps melt, it could be up to 55 inches higher than it is now. Regardless of whether you think about um, any um, political issues surrounding climate change, and there are those who don't believe that it's actually happening, the simple fact is the water level is rising in New York City, um, whatever the reason. And so um, when that happens, aside from land being inundated eventually, when it gets higher than the seawalls that exist, is there's also, um, because of that higher baseline elevation of water, uh, an increased frequency of stronger storms. Uh, so that the 100-year storm, for instance, uh, might occur um, once every 15 to 35 years, for instance, by the 2080s. Uh, and so these two charts are from that climate, climate risk report. Um, this, I believe, is a slide of Hurricane Floyd, which was an early hurricane, not the most recent one. Um, but although New York City doesn't get the kind of hurricanes that um, the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean get, because usually the water temperature is cold enough, uh, as we saw this week, uh, nonetheless, storm surge can be a, a very damaging um, uh, event when it happens in all these low-lying, highly built-up areas of the city. And um, the worst hurricane that happened in, in recent memory was in 1938. It's called the Long Island Express, and it was went through the center of Long Island and created tremendous damage. Um, so uh, it, it has happened, you know, more recently than than we like to think. Uh, and the first project we did related to this actually was a one-week competition that we won in, uh, that was sponsored by the History Channel um, called The City of the Future. And they asked nine teams in, in New York City to imagine what Manhattan would be like in 100 years. We chose to look at what would happen with rising sea levels. And one of our, uh, the maps that we looked at was Egbert Veal's water map of, lower, of, of Manhattan, which is an amazing document that was created in the mid-1800s. It's actually still used by geotechnical engineers in New York to look at subsurface water. But what it shows very clearly, and any of you who've looked at some of the graphics related to what happened in New York this week, uh, it shows all of these low-lying areas, which are landfill, which essentially have all flooded. Uh, um, and it also shows wetlands, uh, which are marsh marshes, as well as the streams that feed them. And for this one-week competition that we did, we, with very limited technical data, we tried to imagine what would happen if these low-lying areas, um, this one in particular is actually the area where our office is located, uh, were to flood. And we thought of creating a kind of infrastructure that um, we called a vane, V-A-N-E, which is uh, named after the structure of the feather of a bird, that would be a kind of horizontal skyscraper. So a hard infrastructure uh, building up on a pier that could become a, uh, built out, occupy the street right of way, and then be fit out with different programs, um, but be essentially raised above the, you know, the uh, water level high enough so that it wouldn't be affected by um, uh, sea level rise, so in effect creating a kind of watery edge and the presence and location of these veins, the white bars that you see there and in that model, would in a way define the low-lying areas of Manhattan in the future. So we projected this as a kind of new way of the city being inhabited. Uh, on the basis of that, we were asked by Guy Nordenson, who's a structural engineer I mentioned earlier. We've collaborated with him on other projects to join a team he was forming for, for the, um, to apply for the Latrobe Prize, which is a grant given by the College of Fellows of the AIA in the United States, American Institute of Architects. And um, so we became uh, architect on that team. It had a landscape architect, um, climate engineers or climate scientists, as well as a GIS mapping specialist. And we specifically looked at 
uh, the impact of rising sea levels and storm surge on the upper harbor of New York and New Jersey and um, ended up with a solution, which I'll describe in a second, but calling for a kind of soft engineering as opposed to hard engineering. So the intent of this study was really to try to learn from some of the lessons of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans where reliance upon a single line of defense, uh, should that line of defense fail, can become quite catastrophic. But this was a two-year research study that we did, and it consisted of a number of, of uh, things that, that we, we explored and studied, but one of them was documentation. So we created the first um, map that combined bathymetry, which is undersea topography, with uh, topography on land. Because it's very important to think about the water's edge as a dynamic condition, and so topography and the gradient between land and water is, is a continuum. It's not necessarily, as we've discovered, uh, respecting a vertical line seawall that's created. And then use that data from this GIS created map to model different hurricane strengths. So green is a category one hurricane um, and, um, and, and higher up to category four, I think is registered here in red. New York City doesn't really get category threes and fours very much, but ones and twos it does and to look at the extent of inundation and then also using software created for um, earthquake analysis to actually map damage to infrastructure and buildings and debris uh, within those areas, again, using GIS um, mapping information. That's an example of that on the right. There's been much more comprehensive. There's a book that we did that was put out for the MoMA show called Palisade Bay, which describes in much greater detail this work. Um, but uh, the proposition we made at the end was what I said, calling for a kind of soft infrastructure that would, in some places, create a slightly elevated edge, such as in lower Manhattan, where there's very little depth to allow water to come in safely. But in other areas, such as um, the Jersey uh, wetland area and parts of Brooklyn, where there's currently industrial building and uh, not a lot of um, uh, people living, to allow water to selectively come in in the event of, of a storm surge, and then to create uh, artificial islands that could create friction in the water to diminish the force of a horizontal force of a storm surge wave. The uh, most damaging hurricane for New York would actually be if the eye of the hurricane came over Staten Island. A hurricane has counterclockwise winds, and that would send a storm surge through the Verrazano Narrows, which is down there, and anything in the path of that surge could suffer damage, uh, depending upon the speed of that wave. We were fortunate in that the, the southerly route of hurricane um, uh, that, that just happened basically um, uh, created a more gradual and didn't have as much velocity of the storm surge wave. Um, so it was basically allowing the water in, but in a controlled way, beginning to create wetlands and um, places which could um, create buffer zones for storm surge, but also could improve water quality and have other benefits. But the project I'll talk about is the Rising Currents Project at MoMA, which we were then, the information in that Latrobe study was used to frame um, a series of projects that were done uh, around the harbor. And we were asked, and we worked together with a landscape architect named Susanna Drake, the firm called D-Land Studio in New York, to look at Lower Manhattan, something we'd looked at in the prior study as well. And the, the basic uh, uh, study began by looking at the transformation uh, of New York City's uh, edge from a gradient or natural edge, uh, sort of pre-European settlement, to this kind of hard seawall that was created pretty much by the late 19th, early 20th century. All of Manhattan was ringed by this seawall. It was used historically for ships to uh, come up next to, to unload goods. And then in the 20th century, a series of piers were built as the way in which goods were unloaded changed and to increase capacity. Uh, so these kind of fingers coming off of the, off of the island. Um, the whole edge of the city is something that was historically never accessible to the public. It was commercial, it was dangerous. It's like um, Marlon Brando's on the waterfront. It was not a place you would go. It was not recreational. Uh, currently, um, 
and, and that's part of the reason why the current waterfront parks that are located around the tip of Manhattan, which have taken the place of this commercial uh, space, are poorly connected back to the, in many cases, to the streets and, and um, spaces inland. So this is kind of disconnected edge morphology because of the way in which the edge historically was developed in New York. So that's the seawall that exists now. And this is uh, what would happen if you had a six foot rise in sea level, which we were predicting would be through incremental sea level rise by 2100, a worst case scenario. Uh, what's kind of crazy is that the roughly 10 and a half foot rise that just occurred is just a little bit more than this and, and caused the kind of flooding that you know, we've all been seeing and reading about. Um, so, but if you had a category two storm surge on top of this six foot rise, so that, that initial six foot rise floods about 20% of lower Manhattan. Uh, a category two storm surge floods about 60% the area in, in shade here. And so those are, the, those are the kind of future conditions, or we thought at the time, future conditions we were uh, designing to address. And then the other w one was uh, this CSO, or Combined Storm Sewer Outlets. These are these triangles are uh, places where the sewer system can actually flow into the harbor in the event that there's even a fraction of an inch of rain because the sewage treatment plants in the city can't handle that flow. And so it's diverted. All of the stormwater and the effluent are diverted into the harbor. So to the tune of an average of about 500 million gallons a week in the city. Um, so that's why you do not want to go swimming in the harbor after it rains in New York. Um, and the city is actually under some pressure to address this problem. And they've done subsequent to this study, they've issued a green infrastructure plan that's trying to look at stormwater mitigation through green roofs and blue roofs and other techniques. But this is a very real problem of the present that we were trying to address as well. So in a way, thinking about the watershed of, of the island, even as built up as it is, but to begin to think about water flow in, in the event of sea level rise and storm surge and water flow out because of uh, stormwater. And what we came up with was a network of streets and uh, uh, ringed by a series of wetlands that process uh, runoff. Uh, so these series of streets um, absorb, they're porous, you'll see in a moment, porous. They absorb, um, distribute, and then collect temporarily stormwater runoff, but also storm surge. And then freshwater and saltwater wetlands, approximately 80 acres of those wetlands are needed to process the runoff from um, uh, storms in lower Manhattan. So to begin to create a kind of hybrid uh, ecological infrastructure and a hard infrastructure. One of the more radical propositions we made was that because of the bathymetry of the Hudson River and how Battery Park was built out, in order to create wetlands there, you have to actually cut back some of the, the landfill there to create shallow enough areas so that you can have uh, vegetation growing and create wetlands. Um, we, that's a diagram of this network of streets and then the uh, wetlands. And then the nature of the street itself was thought about as having two different types of subsurface infrastructure, creating under the sidewalks a wet and a dry, so a telecommunications and electrical and then a water uh, and wet side. And then using the street bed itself and with different street profiles, depending upon whether a street's absorbing, distributing or collecting water, um, as well as planted swales. So, um, so that in effect, creating a very radical proposition about the way public space, the street space in lower Manhattan could be conceived in the future. It also um, envisioned that, uh, particularly because this part of the city is well served by public transportation, that uh, there would not need to be as many cars on the street. And so parking spaces could be turned into planted areas as well. It had a whole series of studies of different types of vegetation that can survive salt water uh, inundation on an infrequent basis and uh, also that can process um, stormwater runoff. Uh, a cross section through the one of the wetlands. That triangle that you see there is the existing seawall. We actually created a, a slight berming up at the edge as well so that the incremental rise that I was talking about, the six foot rise, would not continuously flood in 20% of the city. 
depending upon where in the city uh, outside of Lower Manhattan, as I said, you could allow the water in further. And then this is a view rendering of the tip of Manhattan uh, and sort of this transformed relationship between the city and nature um, that can come about from rethinking this um, way in which infrastructure is thought about and really a new kind of conception of public space. We, living in uh, Manhattan in a way, and unlike I think what you have in Vancouver, we're not always mindful of the kind of amazing uh, water that surrounds us and the fact that it's, it is a kind of tremendous asset. People are fortunately becoming more cognizant of that, but uh, the idea is that this is our nature and, and uh, it can become a really well-connected part of the life of the city. So from this kind of thinking about uh, infrastructure and as a definition of public space, uh, we've also thought about on the scale of urban planning, and we were doing this project for Greenwich South, which is also in Lower Manhattan, concurrently with the Rising Currents project. Uh, but this was for the Alliance for Downtown New York. And we really thought about designing the process in which an urban plan could be made. That's what I'll be talking about. So really thinking about a new way of thinking about urban planning, not about creating a kind of idealized uh, master plan, which to be successful has to be created uh, as originally intended, but as a kind of flexible framework for the set of objectives that can be created over time. Um, Greenwich South neighborhood is uh, this 40 acre area that's just south of Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan. And it's really interesting in that it's uh, close to everything but doesn't feel like it's anything and is tremendously underbuilt, yet it's heavily served by public transportation. It's uh, surrounded by Wall Street to the east, uh, which is number three, uh, Battery Park City to the west, um, future development ongoing at Ground Zero to the north, and then Battery Park to the south. And we were, our study was really about how to begin to weave it into the fabric of those areas and how to enhance it as a place to live and work as part of the kind of renaissance of Lower Manhattan that's been happening in the last 15 years or so. So we started our work with a period of research and analysis uh, which involved mapping of information, um, programs, uses, air rights, uh, historical data, uh, street sections, comparative scales of, of this area with other parts of uh, the city and other places in the world, um, formal or, or uh, diagrams of circulation sequences, and also created an outreach program to solicit um, public feedback about um, what um, people outside of our design team and our client thought about the, the neighborhood and what their um, wants and desires were. And then we created a brain trust, uh, which was, and, and choreographed a, a dinner and follow-up um, communications with a whole series of different people, um, some of whom lived in the neighborhood, some of them who didn't, uh, to begin to think more critically about this part of the city. On the basis of that, we defined uh, five principles for um, future development in this neighborhood. Um, and this is just showing one of them, Reconnect Greenwich Street. When Ground Zero is completed, um, Greenwich Street, which used to terminate in the podium of the old World Trade Center towers, will actually be a spatial corridor that will pass by. It may or may not be vehicularly accessible because of security concerns but at the present, but it will be a street that passes through. And um, that's what's represented in that diagram at the top. And once that happens, um, it will allow this neighborhood to connect all the way through up to um, uh, roughly 14th Street um, and be part of a kind of sequence on the west side. So there are a whole set of implications that come out of that possibility uh, and design uh, strategies that relate to that. Or this one is called Build for Density, Design for People which is about how to create more dense development on par with what's happening in other world cities like Seoul, uh, Tokyo, um, Shanghai. Again, because the area is so well served by public transportation, how to create public realm that rises above street level into the base podiums of buildings. So looking at all the consequences for that and implications of that. 
and how to create density in a way that's still something that has a qualitative, positive quality of life experience. We created uh, several different types of uh, deliverables that were used to communicate these ideas to different constituencies. This is one of them. Uh, another, which I don't think might show up in a later slide, was a tabloid publication that about 10,000 of which were printed and distributed at the exhibition I'll show in a moment. Uh, on our team was a writer, a graphic designer, uh, urban planning consultant that we've worked with on before, uh, Byer Blender Bell, the urban planning group there. And, um, and then we asked uh, uh, several of our colleagues, as well as some artists and a uh, graphic designer, to envision how these different uh, long-term, medium-term, and short-term uh, steps could be implemented. So we had a series of meetings and mapped out these different overall goals, and then which design team could work on uh, design propositions to show how that might be realized. Uh, and a different way of mapping the sites within the Greenwich South study area and who, who is working on immediate, medium, and long-term solutions for that area. So this is a short-term solution um, created by a graphic designer that actually was the one who designed all the materials. His name is Scott Stoll, a firm called um, Open. And uh, this was um, the exit sign on the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel uh, entry and exit. This is actually the building that's in the Men in Black movies. It's the headquarters of their thing. But um, this was created by Shane Cohen, who's a landscape architect based out of Minneapolis, creating a greenscape along Greenwich Street. One of the challenges with Greenwich Street is it's the subway line runs underneath it. So you can't actually do tree pits in that area. So how do you create vertical uh, green? space. Uh, this was an artist um, whose name I am now blanking on. Uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer is his name. This was a short-term installation using a helium-filled balloon that would have sunspots, video of sunspots projected on it over the uh, battery tunnel entrance. So it's kind of making people aware of this as a place. Um, and there were several other artists that were created uh, concepts for installations. This is a project that was created by Iwamoto Scott uh, for a very unusual site uh, to create a tower on this very quirky site just north of the battery tunnel entrance, and uh, which become a kind of icon for this neighborhood. Um, really interesting design. And then project we took on ourselves, which is to take this battery tunnel entrance, which is this kind of gaping chasm in the, in the neighborhood, uh, in this study area that very difficult to literally get across this one small pedestrian path uh, and to create a program amenity that's not present in the neighborhood, a green market, and also more park space in, inland in an area. So this was called Market Park. Basically uses air rights that are transferred from the, the value of those air rights that are given to surrounding buildings. They're transferred from this um, bridge, uh, this uh, tunnel uh, entrance. And then the revenue from that is used to create this uh, park and uh, open air uh, market space. The building bridges across the tunnel and then has this uh, open air roof structure that is um, shading to the south and creating indirect light from the north. Um, this is a view looking southwest, Statue of Liberty just there in the distance. And then the way in which this bridge is over uh, the Battery Tunnel. This is at the southern end of the building. It faces uh, Battery Park and uh, is a kind of public plaza on the southern end. And then a view of the interior um, as you're walking north um, through the building. And then finally, this was, all this information was put out to the public in the form of an exhibit as well as, oh yeah, here's the slide I was thinking of. Uh, different types of uh, additional deliverables. So a tabloid publication called What If, which looked at what will happen in the future. And, uh, and then a public exhibition in Zuccotti Park, pre-Occupy Wall Street, <laughs> this was in 2009, uh, that was up for about six weeks, four to six weeks, to show um, um, all these ideas to the public. Again, thought about it as a very beginning of a long-term process to begin to reconceive the way in which this neighborhood um, is thought about 
and how it might be uh, come in the future. And then that's a diagram of, of uh, yeah, the sort of character of that with some of these projects within it, the neighborhood on the right, uh, left, I mean, and then this process again that we, we worked through. So um, again, the design of a process to bring about a new way of thinking about uh, urban planning and public space. So the last project I'm going to show is one that in a way gets back to the sort of Nisian aesthetic in some respects, but we were thinking about the sort of ephemeral quality of an experience, in this case, quality of occupying the water's edge. Uh, this is a boat pavilion that we created uh, as part of a new public park in Beacon, New York. The white building there on the bottom is Dia Beacon, for those of you who are familiar with the Contemporary Art Museum. Beacon is about on the Hudson River there, about 65 miles or so north of New York City. And uh, we were uh, part of a team that created a new park on a brownfield site for Scenic Hudson, which is a land trust based in the Hudson Valley. Uh, our work consisted of two projects that were separated by about 100 yards. One was the adaptive reuse of a post and beam barn from 1865, making it into an art and environmental education center, and then a new structure within the park, the longer rectangle, that's a kayak and canoe pavilion as part of a, with a deck that allows you to launch these boats into the water. And the landscape architects for the project were Reed Hildebrand. They're based out of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The barn is a kind of uh, iconic building that many people in the community were quite fond of. It was built originally as a um, uh, some sort of a hardware store, or a, I believe it was a hardware store, uh, and at a time when everything around it was kind of commercial, industrial um, use. Uh, very simple, uh, trying to be um, mindful of the character of the building and use as many of the elements uh, that were there as possible, while at the same time putting in an elevator, fire protection, lead gold, uh, all these other things. Canadian windows again, by the way. <laughs> I believe a company called Cascadia. They're based here in British Columbia, right? Yes. These are, again, fiberglass, high-performance windows. Um, I'm glad I got that point in, by the way. Most people, would, that wouldn't mean as much as it does, I think. Too. but. Um, but uh, so this was the kind of, not about the main focus I'll be talking about is the pavilion, but just to show you the thinking about these two projects with respect to each other, but also to um, their very different functions. The boat pavilion um, we thought about from very early on as this kind of, how can we articulate this transition, this kind of threshold or liminal space between water and land? and also make something that was visually very porous to allow for continuity of space between land and water and something quite in contrast to you know, a kind of pavilion that would be more overtly about itself, although the slides I'll show you kind of document the building, but also about this, this quality of flow and movement um, between land and water. The building is about 3,000 square feet. Uh, it's open air structure, roofed. Um, has storage spaces for about 64 uh, canoes or kayaks. They have a lottery which allows you to store your boat in there. And then there's an operator, who, um, a local um, outdoor st uh, store nearby that operates this uh, seasonally during the warmer months. And thought about the design really as a kind of composition of lines, uh, lines that are parallel or perpendicular to the water that begin to define this movement as well as um, uh, reducing the presence of the structure within the building, the visual uh, impact of structure. A couple cross sections, about 12 feet high. Construction as kind of erasure of the means needed to uh, achieve this effect. And then image of the building before the kayaks and canoes are placed in there and then later image as well. And then a couple of shots of the completed building uh, facing toward the river as well as uh, beside it. So the, the 
enclosures are made out of grill material, so they become scrim-like in some respects and also uh, more opaque or transparent depending upon your orientation with respect to them. And then a view, this was actually on opening day. They hadn't quite finished the building, but they, so that's why there aren't canoes inside the building, but uh, they had a lot of canoes. This was about a year, a little over a year ago. And then a view of the building completed. Just got a very low profile 15 kilowatt solar array on the top of it that was put in about a month ago. It's not in this image. So I'm gonna wrap up, this is my last slide, but I wanted to make clear the point that I think by framing design in terms of conditions outside of uh, form in a way, uh, looking at everything from material phenomena through a uh, process of how design is conceived all the way to this kind of quality of an experience of a site, I think we've been able to achieve uh, a much more um, uh, sort of dynamic sense of the relationship between architecture and um, uh, the kind of social and physical relationships that it's a part of. And for us, that's been very exciting, and it's kind of defined um, our work. And in a way, is what excites us about maintaining and continuing to do the kind of diversity of work that, that we have on the boards now. So um, I'll wrap it up there so we have a couple minutes for questions. But uh, thank you very much.